Thank you so much, Vina, for, um, <coughs> for framing this and responding, hopefully. And uh, to Mahmoud for hosting and Mandy. Um, Mandy, I know, will be much missed here, so um, <coughs> I'm sure a lot of you are, are here to see her also. And a special thanks to uh, brothers and sisters from Unite from the UK who are here today this evening. Um, I'm going to start by saying a few words about the origin of this book, which is what book authors are supposed to do. Um, and really, they started um, 40 years ago for me, uh, after I graduated from university in Scotland, um, as part of my gap year of traveling. I spent a few months in the kibbutz, kibbutz Ginesar in the Galilee. And the Galilee was in a state of turmoil at the time. Uh, Israeli forces had just withdrawn from the, the first invasion of southern Lebanon and the campaign to Judaize the Galilee had been stepped up, so there was a lot of expropriation of land going on. The most famous resident of that kibbutz was Igal Alon, whom I'm sure some of you know quite a bit about, uh, eminent soldier statesman. Uh, of, uh, of Israel, and uh, before that he was the founder of the Palmach, the, the elite commando unit of the Haganah, and he founded the Palmach at the kibbutz in the 1940s. Here he is addressing a, an assembly of Palestinian notables on the kibbutz. And in 1948 he was the commander of Operation Broom, Broom as in sweep away the, the residents, the Arab residents of the Galilee, and in his memoirs he spoke openly about his efforts to cleanse the Galilee. This was a term that he used. This is me 40 years ago, as you can see. <laughs> as you can see, I was a bit of a hippie, and uh, actually I still am a hippie. Um, they put me to work in the grapefruit orchards and on occasion in the banana fields. And at the end of one of the work shifts in the banana fields, I noted two, two men walking away from the work crew towards the Tiberias Road. And they, were, they didn't look, they weren't walking like a typical kibbutznik male, so I figured they must be Palestinian day laborers. And indeed they were. And I got it into my head I should ask some questions. You know, where do you live? How much do you pay? How do you feel about working on land that was probably stolen from your foremothers and forefathers? But I never got a chance. I left shortly thereafter to travel in Egypt. And I didn't return until 36 years later, when some friends making a film in the West Bank invited me to come and do interviews with workers. Uh, I'm a labor analyst, so a lot of what I do is interview workers. And previously, we had been spending a bit of time in Abu Dhabi uh, doing similar kinds of research, taking testimony in labor camps from South Asian migrant workers in Abu Dhabi. The government didn't like what we were doing there, so they, they kicked us out and said, you can't come here anymore. And so we ended up in, um, in the West Bank. And uh, if you're interested, this book documents the, 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 our, our work in the Gulf. It's called The Gulf, High Culture, Hard Labor. So when, when we started interviewing workers, we realized we'd gone from interviewing migrant workers in the Gulf to migrant workers in their own land, which is a quite different proposition, somewhat related but quite different proposition. And I realized here I am finally asking the questions that I had likely formulated in my head 36 years before. So I, I, I got this idea that I might be able to write a book, um, because the film was going to take a long time to make, and indeed it has taken a long time to make. Now, when you set out to write a book, uh, or at least I do, I always ask myself, how can this be a, a useful book? There's a lot of useless books out there. You have to convince yourself you're going to write a useful book that, that the audiences will be able to use. And I'm not a regional specialist, so I had to do a lot of convincing. And um, the first thing I noticed in the, my preliminary research was there's not a lot written about Palestinian livelihoods, about Palestinian labor, at least in English. I don't read Arabic. And uh, the, uh, partly I think it's because Palestine watchers internationally tend to focus on other things, land theft, evictions, demolitions, soldier brutality, human rights violations, 
mass incarceration and so on and so forth, and all for very good reasons, but there's not a lot of attention to what Palestinians do on a daily basis to put food on the table for their families. So I figured uh, the labor research I could do might help to fill that gap. The second reason I found to think it might be useful uh, had to do with the stone industry in the West Bank. And I discovered, uh, to my astonishment, that there isn't a single published study of the stone industry, which, which kind of bamboozled me because it's the largest private sector employer in the West Bank. And if you add in all the workers who work in the construction industry using the stone in the aggregate, it's probably a greater number than the Palestine, Palestinian Authority public sector payroll. It's the largest share of GDP. It's the largest share of exports from the occupied territories. And for such a small population, Palestinians are actually the 12th largest stone producer in the world, just behind the U.S. and in front of Russia. And stone um, is one of the two natural resources that Palestinians <coughs> have that Israel does not have, the other one being water, of course, and most of that gets siphoned off by the Israelis using advanced pumping technology. So the stone is, is a big natural resource, it's still largely under Palestinian ownership and control. That's what makes it so important. Here's a geological map of stone deposits. Um, this is some of the best dolomitic limestone in the world, and it's in the central highlands, the spine, mountainous spine, that we're part of here. Um, and depending on where you live, you, you will think that your regional stone is the best. <laughs> and I'm, I'm quite agnostic about this, I think it's all beautiful. Um, but um, what happens to it? Well, when it's quarried, uh, some of it's used in the West Bank, some of it goes to countries in the region, 75% of it finds itself inside the Green Line or in the, in the settlements. And what that means is that the very contents of Palestinian land are being used to build up the Israeli state and the spreading archipelago of settlements that stretches all over the West Bank. Now, there's a tragic irony in this. Um, it's a resource curse in addition because like many poor countries that have oil as their natural resource, it, it's a double-edged asset in a way, and primarily it's a curse for environmental reasons in this case. The industry is very lightly regulated, and as a result it um, sickens the workforce. There are many well-known occupational ailments associated with working with stone, and it ravages the environment. As I'm sure many of you know who traveled in the West Bank, the strip mining is a, is a very ugly scar on the landscape, and Hardly any of the quarries are repurposed for other, um, for other uses. There's about 1,200 firms, and uh, they are um, the, basically the supply line is from the quarries to the factories, the workshops, crushers, across the green line, the construction sites, right? So I decided for my research, I would do interviews at every point in that chain. I would follow the path of the stone, but also follow the path of the labor, because the labor is in motion across the supply chain. So I interviewed in the quarries, and I interviewed in the factories where the stone is cut and fabricated. A lot of this work is automated now. I interviewed in the workshops where it is uh, polished and finished, and also the stone is dressed using these chiseling techniques, tubze. Um, which are, um, uh, you know, generations, almost centuries old, basically the same, the same technology. And uh, I interviewed in the checkpoints on the construction sites in the suburbs of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And I also did interviews with workers coming back in the evening uh, through the checkpoints, because you get a different kind of interview when workers are coming home. And uh, I'm sure you know for some of them it's a very long day, stretch from 3 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. It's a very arduous journey uh, and a risky one because there is humiliation and abuse on the other side of the green line for many of these workers. Very little time for their families when they get home at night. 
and some of them are in a great hurry to get home and take some risks like this fellow who's jumping over barbed wire. I also interviewed in, in villages that were right next to the settlements, and a lot of these villages provide the workforce for the settlement. They have no alternative. Um, well, there aren't any alternatives that pay a living wage, so they're obliged in a way to work in the settlements. And uh, many of them are working on land and sometimes in buildings that were only very recently part of their own villages. So you can imagine how difficult that is and how psychologically uh, problematic it is. The structure of the industry is that it's mostly small family owners. The same names come up again and again, which mean that it's largely undercapitalized, underprofessionalized, and as I mentioned earlier, underregulated. The families know each other, they've known each other for generations, they, they're in the same village. So when they compete with one another, they do it rather carefully. It's what I call careful competition. It's not, you know, it's capitalist competition, but it's not cutthroat predatory competition. Um, there are other capitalist economies on the West Bank, as you know, probably most famously, the, the circle of crony capitalists around the Palestinian Authority who um, uh, control the provision of goods and services from Israel to the mass of the, of the, of the West Bank population. I interviewed in the workers' union. Uh, it's a relatively weak union, at least compared to the owner's union. The union of stone and marble is the owner's union, it's quite powerful. Um, mostly the, the, the workers' union is focused on health and safety issues, which are very important. Um, but I find that they, they rarely go, go, go to war with the employers over uh, wages and conditions. Um, there's also a number of new unions in, um, in the West Bank, relatively <coughs> independent of the PGFTU and, and quite remote from centers of power. And likewise, I interviewed similar unions in Israel that have also sprung up in recent years uh, that, that likewise are independent of the Histadrut and uh, centers of power. And I found there's a, there's a certain amount of informal cooperation across the green line. It's not, it's not easy, it's not supposed to happen, but it makes sense if you're interested in, in getting some gains and wins for workers on either side of the green line. Just to give you one example, um, these, are, these are workers at Sarfati Garage. Um, they are voting for the first collective bargaining contract in a, in a West Bank settlement, industrial zone. The Palestinian workers, they were organized by an Israeli trade union. Israeli trade unions can organize in the settlements. Palestinian trade unions cannot do so, so it makes sense to do this. And if you find a trade union willing to do it, it, it makes a big difference. Likewise, in Israel, there are there being some gains for Palestinian workers who are working there. Um, uh, in, in, in health and safety, and also, to some degree, in wages. Um, I interviewed quite a lot of uh, uh, stone firm owners. When you're doing labor research, it's important not just to interview workers, but also interview the employers. <laughs> and I found that the employers, like employers everywhere in the world, tend to complain about the same kinds of things. You know, workers don't work hard enough, uh, they want too much money, and so on and so forth. Um, but they also had a lot of complaints about the conditions and constraints and limits placed upon the industry by the occupier, by the Israeli authorities. The point here is not to shut the industry down because it provides a vital service to the Israeli economy. The point is to make it really difficult to operate business as usual. And, and also, always, I think, to impose a certain structure of humiliation on, uh, on those who are running the enterprises. Just to give you one example, Palestinian producers are not allowed to use dynamite in the quarries. And this puts them at a considerable disadvantage in competition with other producers in the region. 
you know, with explosives, you can move a lot of stone in a short period of time. Here, they have to use this relatively primitive stone cutting machinery. And you probably noticed that the worker is not wearing any protective clothing. Uh, this I find quite routine in a lot of the workplaces I visited, and I got a number of explanations for that. Invariably, after I'd interviewed stone company owners, they would invite me back to their homes for some warm Palestinian hospitality, and I always said yes. And after a while, I realized um, part of the reason why they're doing this is to showcase their wealth. Show me how wealthy they are, because they tended to live in <coughs> fairly lavish hilltop mansions. And, um, and, you know, a lot of them are doing quite well, I would say, at least compared to the workers. They are, in some sense, a, a beneficiary, beneficiaries of the occupation economy. Now, as you can imagine, uh, in a lot of my interviews, what came across was... Um, testimony to what it's like to work for the occupier, the psychology of working for the occupier, which includes a lot of humiliation uh, mixed in with other sentiments, but humiliation especially for those who are, who are laboring on the settlements, and, and even more so for those who are building the separation wall, who are basically building their own prison wall. And uh, there are a lot of quotes uh, in the book. I tried to feature workers' voices as much as I could. I just picked out one here today for you. A uh, fellow who was trying to summarize the, the power asymmetry on the landscape of labor. He said, we build their houses while they demolish our homes. And he wanted me to, you know, pay attention to the distinction between houses and homes, which was what he was trying to get across. The workers are very much aware of how their jobs are used as what I call a colonial bargaining chip. What that means is that Israeli authorities will issue them with a work permit to come and work in Israel on condition that they keep the peace. If one of your family steps out of line, throws a stone, and a soldier gets arrested, ends up in jail, you lose your work permit. And it could be a distant relative of the family. And that's a major blow to the livelihood of the family. So, basically this is a policy of economic pacification. It's a very effective form of social control. And that's one of the reasons Israeli authorities really like this permit system. And they really like uh, uh, being able to employ so many Palestinians. It's not the only reason. There are other reasons which I can go into. Um, but mostly, I was interested in, in the book, in documenting their daily lives, because I felt it really hadn't adequately been done. I mean, what, just what they do on a daily basis, what they have to go through. And what came across to me was their overall, their resilience. And I say the resilience of male brethren is it's a, it's an almost wholly masculine trait. There were some women that I found working in the upper reaches of management in some of the firms, I interviewed them. But it's, uh, it's really a, it, it's a sort of study in masculine psychology in a way, um, part of the book. And um, what struck me was that in spite of all the indignities and obstacles thrown in their paths on a daily basis, they resolutely show up for work and they've been doing this for years, for decades, some of them. And uh, this struck me as this sort of resolute will to show up for work as a, a kind of reflection of the Palestinian resistance philosophy of sumut, or steadfastness. That in spite of everything, we're not going to change our ways, we're not going to change what we do, we're going to keep on doing what we do. We will not be moved, and so on and so forth. Now, stonemasons are uh, part of my book because you have to tell the story of the stonemasons. Um, really, before the industry was industrialized, which happened after 1967, stonemasonry was very much a craft-based uh, set of workplaces. <coughs> Every large village in Palestine had a master mason who designed and built large structures without any professional training it should be said, and passed on, you know, the knowledge to other generations. 
And uh, this is, I guess this is an example of what today would be called architecture without architects, right? They didn't have any professional training, but they built palaces, they built hilltop villages, um, they built township uh, cores. From the mid-19th century, they got into the business of city building. They built Yaffa, they built Bethlehem, they built Hebron, they built Nablus, they built Haifa. They even built large parts of Tel Aviv, the first Hebrew city. And then they started building other states in the region. This is Amman and Jordan. They basically built Jordan. When the post-colonial Gulf states needed their expertise to come and build these nation states, they went and built these states. They built Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and the UAE. In fact, it's not unfair to say that Palestinians have built almost every state in the region, except for their own, tragically. And that includes Israel, that list includes Israel. So, basically for the, for, uh, the, the last part of the book, I decided that I had to go into the historical record. I've been doing these interviews, but I realized that some of the answers to my questions lay in the historical record, labor history. And especially try to answer this question, who built Israel? I think internationally, if you ask that question in the public mind, people will say, well, Jewish settlers built Israel. Of course, the pioneers, right? They were unused to manual labor, they came here, they learned on the job, they learned how to staff the cement mixers and build bricks, build the bricks, and they made new Jews of themselves. At least according to the doctrine of labor Zionism. Labor Zionism was a prevailing settler philosophy at the time. But if you look a little more closely at, at the labor record, you find uh, a different reality. And basically I found that Palestinian workers have always been at the center of building um, on these lands. Some of that history has been obscured by the romance of the kibbutz. You know, the agrarian romance of the kibbutz, of the socialist kibbutz especially, which you know, attracted people of my generation to go and spend a few months there, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. But some of you probably know that the kibbutz is really a solution to a problem. And the problem for Jewish settlers was, how can you extract a European standard of living from a Middle Eastern agricultural livelihood? Right? It's not, the answer to that is not obvious how you would do that. And indeed, several efforts to do so failed until the kibbutz came along and it, it succeeded because it was collective pooling of resources withdrawn from the marketplace. So there was a, this model of self-sufficiency which, which, uh, which was able to succeed. And this is in rural areas. If you go to the urban sector, and here historically I'm really talking about the period of the British Mandate, a lot of the Jewish settlers were socialists and they demanded their workers' rights and they demanded what they called European wages or a European standard of living, as opposed to what they called an Arab wage, which was a prevailing market wage at the time. They managed to get that European wage from subsidies from World Zionist organizations, which topped up the wage to the European level. And that, in many ways, is the origin of a, a very long pattern of subsidies from external organizations, from world Jewry, to the Israeli economy, which continues to this day. I think when people think about the West Bank, they think about the donors, you know? <laughs> and, but if you actually do an ec 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 economist breakdown, um, the level of subsidy per capita to the Israeli economy is actually greater than the level of subsidy to the Palestinian economy. A few words about this, uh, what I call the conquest, well, what was called the conquest of labor. These days when you mention the word boycott, everyone thinks of BDS, right? But the, the longest running boycott in these lands has been a boycott of Arab labor. And it really begins with this campaign, which is called Conquest of Labor, which is about Jewish domination of the labor market. A lot of pressure was put on employers, both Jewish and foreign, during the mandate, to uh, expunge their workforces 
and have Jewish-only workforces, Hebrew labor it's called. And I found in my research that this campaign, although it went on for 25 years or so, was only partially successful. And in fact, employers always preferred Palestinian labor. Why, why would they do that in the face of all of this pressure? Well, the Palestinian workers were cheaper, they were more skilled, they had generations of construction experience in the region, and they were also a little less militant in their, in their labor politics and their labor demands. So, which employer would not prefer that kind of workforce, right? It's a, that's a no-brainer. But that preference for Palestinian labor has persisted through the decades and is still very much active today. And so part of my job in the book was to try and track that, that preference for Palestinian labor. Let me say a few words about Tel Aviv because it's an important case study in my book. This is Korkar stone which is different from limestone in the central highlands. This is the sandstone of the coastal region and uh, much softer, lithified sand dunes basically. The stonemasons of Yaffa worked with this stone and they dominated the labor market. <coughs> when the founders of Tel Aviv, a Jewish suburb north of Yaffa, decided to build this, this suburb, their funders wanted them only to use Jewish workers. Now that would have been impossible <laughs> under the circumstances because the, the Palestinian stonemasons of Yaffa were in complete control. And if you tried to use Jewish workers, there would have been a lot of labor conflict. And indeed, there was initially some labor conflict. So what the, 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 the founding fathers of Tel Aviv did, which is something employers often do when there's a labor conflict, is they tried to find a technological solution. So what they did was they found a substitute for this stone. <coughs> They invented a silicate brick initially, and then they started importing and using cement and concrete. These were all materials that Jewish workers could more easily use, and importantly, then they were not dependent on the stonemasons of Yaffa. And over time, a cult of concrete developed in Israel, especially after 1948. Uh, this was a material that was supposed to be tough and uh, enduring and unyielding and reflected the, the preferred image of the new nation, right? And today, of course, the march of concrete across the West Bank is uh, the unsavory brand mark of the occupation itself. But I tell you this story because uh, I want you to remember that the, the choice of the material, the original reason for the choice of the material was to cut out the, the Arab workers. Um, at the same time as this cult of concrete's going on, we're seeing a lot of architectural cleansing happening, basically in the period between 48 and 67. Efforts to eradicate almost every building that's part of the, the heritage of the region in the state of Israel. Right? The bulldozers are moving in, they're, they're flattening villages, they're flattening urban quarters, Everything's being erased, and what's being erected is something that owes nothing, owes no debts to the built heritage of the region. That comes to a stop in 1967. I mean, not overnight, but that flight away from the heritage of the region goes into reverse, and largely because of what happens here, the occupation of the old city of Jerusalem. When that happens, the, the so-called biblical archaeologists are put to work in the old city. What they do is they dig down, they excavate until they reach a historical <coughs> layer that they consider to be the, the landscape of Jewish antiquity. They throw away the other layers, much to the chagrin of UNESCO. Um, and so, as a result, the old stones of Palestine begin to be seen through new eyes. Israeli Jews begin to look at the old stones of Palestine through a different lens. They're no longer seen as the crumbling remnants of a backward civilization that have to be eradicated with bulldozers and the like. They're now seen as sort of magical pathways to this, this landscape of Jewish antiquity. That's happening in Jerusalem, and it's very much driven by religion. 
In Tel Aviv, there's a similar camp, there's a similar sort of revival of interest in old stone going on, but it's not driven by religion, it's driven by real estate value. Old stone and mortar buildings, vintage decor, anything that's old acquires new volume. And it's not just happening there, of course, all over the industrialized world, we see this in cities, we associate it now with gentrification, rehabbing, and so on and so forth. But in, in, this, in this part of the world, it has a very particular political meaning, always. It's never, uh, it's never purely about market value. But in Tel Aviv, and so, you know, if you go to Yaffa now, you, you see sort of condo buildings like this, rehab uh, jobs that include Arab vernacular architecture, arabesques and the like, which, which were shunned before. And this is, this is a, something I call automania. It's a phenomenon. It's this sort of rage and fever, all things that smack of the Ottoman. Uh, you can't get enough of it. And it, it's also here in Jerusalem, I think. Um, and astonishingly, when I started my um, reporting in 2015 in Yaffa, some of the old buildings around the old core were fetching the very highest real estate prices in Israel. You know, which is just mind-blowing, given that it, was, it wasn't that long before that these buildings were being demolished and piled up in rubble on the beaches of Yaffa. And lo and behold, Kirkar, this stone that had been shunned by Tel Avivians, a century before, is now back in hot demand. I can't get enough of it. There's not much of it left. Along with workers who, can, who are actually skilled working with it, and there's not many of them either. In fact, this wall fell down after I took a picture of it. Not long after I took a picture of it. <laughs> All right, so you move across uh, the green line, 25 kilometers from Tel Aviv, and it's a similar Reevaluation of old stone going on. And Fida has been very much a part of that, <laughs> among other things she's done with her career. Uh, so she's a real expert on this, on this part of it. It's happening not for real estate reasons. Um, old, old stone buildings in the West Bank don't quite yet have a lot of real estate value in and of themselves. I mean, that may change, that may happen, sooner rather than later, but I don't think it's happening right now. There are, there are all sorts of reasons. One, the major one, I suppose, is revaluation of revival of Palestinian cultural heritage. Um, it's a, also a way of staving off the Palestinian bulldozer, which can be as destructive as the Hebrew bulldozer. Uh, a bulwark against settlers. If you restore a building, get it historically listed, it makes it just a little more difficult for settlers to see. And uh, also evidence of long-standing residence. So these are Palestinian facts on the ground, which are very important um, to, uh, uh, to have. Um, I studied some of the groups that are doing this kind of work. We walk in Ramallah, the Center for Heritage Preservation in Bethlehem, and the Old City Revitalization Program here in Jerusalem. They're doing similar kinds of work, but in different circumstances, because these are quite different cities in a way, and uh, the approach is, is somewhat different. Um, here's an example of a restoration. This is Jabba, old, the old village core of Jabba, east of Jerusalem, before <coughs> and after. As you can see, quite a transformation. I interviewed uh, some of the workers involved in the restoration project. Some of them were old timers, like this fellow. Some of them were much younger and were learning on the job from the old timers. And um, yeah, so let me move towards a conclusion. Um, basically, my research, the labor research, showed that, as I said earlier, Palestinians have been at the center of the construction workforce for a century or more, quite consistently, um, all the way through the mandate, after the Nakba, and even today. There have been three efforts to replace them, three big efforts to replace them over that period of time. The first one was the conquest of labor, which I already mentioned, right? 
Second one was, involved the importation of Mizrahi Jews from Arab countries in the region after 1948. And the third one was a form of collective punishment for the first intifada. This uh, whole-scale effort to import migrant workers from overseas. None of these campaigns have been entirely successful. They've only ever been partially successful. And today, if you look at the, the numbers, and the numbers are always soft, but if you look at the numbers, um, they're at an all-time high. The number of West Bank Palestinians working in Israel or in the settlements. There's only one small period that I could find after 48, when Israeli Palestinians left inside Israel were under military lockdown and couldn't leave their villages, so very difficult for them to join the workforce. But it was only a year or two before they were back on the construction site. So it's fair to say that Palestinians have had a decisive hand in the building of almost every fixed asset on the land, from the river to the sea. And what do you get for that? This is uh, my last, uh, the last thing that I put on the table in the book. It's a very speculative argument, but sometimes you're you're under pressure to, you know, to send to send an argument out into the world after you've done your research. So I came up with this. It's uh, my argument for political sweat equity, and it basically is an attempt to answer the question: What rights accrue to a population that has spent a century or more making these labor contributions. And what additional forms of restitution are due to a population that was made into a compulsory workforce. And I use that term because we're not talking about forced labor here. We're not talking about bonded labor, which would be more the case in the Gulf states, with migrant workers in the Gulf states. We're talking about compulsory labor because because of the lack of alternatives. And this is by design of Israeli economic policy. It's engineered so that there are no alternatives that pay a living wage. And that's what makes it compulsory. So I appeal to this principle of political sweat equity, which is that if you build a country, that ought to translate into civil and political rights in that country. And I imagine that if and when the negotiations start again, uh, between Israelis and Palestinians about a final status, and that's a big if, because I don't think it's happening anytime soon. But if and when it happens, all the old claims, the old Palestinian claims will still be on the table uh, about debts from the past. The losses in the Nakba, the compensation for moral suffering for decades since then, the right of return of refugees, and so on and so forth. These are all debts from the past, which in my opinion at least need to be repaid. And you could call that reparative justice. But to get to a new kind of state, a future state, a single state, which everyone's talking about, you need to put new claims on the table. You need, you need new claims that are part of transitional justice. You can't simply have the old claims. You need new claims in addition not as replacements, but as supplementary claims to move the needle and move the discussion forward. So, I'm just imagining that this labor-based um, argument could be one of those. Again, not as a replacement or as a substitute, but as a supplementary <coughs> claim. You might be justified in saying, well, how has that worked in other parts of the world? And, and I'd have to say, not very well, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, many industrialized countries were built, uh, using the country I live as an, in as an example, um, enslaved and bonded and indentured and immigrant workforces built uh, the country I live in. Um, and um, they all made this claim at a certain point in history. Said, you know, we, we built this country, we deserve full social inclusion here, and we deserve rights. And there wasn't an immediate response to these claims, but I think over time, the moral course of the argument did help to translate into civic and legal acceptance of these laboring populations. I'm talking about populations that were brought from other places to build the country, 
In this case, we're talking about Palestinians who are laboring on their own ancestral lands. They didn't come from anywhere else. And so the argument is, I think, reinforced and should be stronger and should be magnified. And I just want to end and leave you with the, the words of one of the workers I interviewed here. Um, he was standing at a checkpoint line and he said, look, I've been building homes every day over there for 30 years. In a way, it's really my country too, isn't it? And I thought that was a very elegant um, and concise way of, uh, of putting, you know, argument that I've been using $25 words to describe. And, and, I, and I liked it, so I, I want to end with his words. Thank you. I found it really interesting the way you tie different issues together and using labor as a lens to dissect or understand the situation. But I had a few remarks. The way you ended your presentation and the point where you talked about uh, labor uh, trade unions, Israeli trade unions, organizing Palestinian laborers in settlements because Palestinian trade unions couldn't access the settlements. Is that, does that tie in with your conclusion of alluding to a single state, quote unquote, of having class and labor as the organizing element? And I recall the Communist Party in Israel in the 40s, and prior to that, had that argument. And mm -hmm. Did you look at that and how that ended with the context no, of well, changing? Yeah. And uh, another thing, <coughs> maybe it's more, um, for me it was also interesting to see the line of cement coming into Tel Aviv and then the fetish going back to stone. And I recall working in the walk early, in the late 90s, early 2000, and at that time, the fetish in villages was with cement. All the laborers coming back from all the yeah. settlements, they yeah. had this fetish. So all their houses would be clad with cement. Right. And it was the cool thing to have. Yeah. And trying to, come or to talk about it the other way around was a problem to them. Uh -huh. We faced that yeah. thing. And just the idea of... Um, the argument of restoration to show that you actually existed in that land at the link part of history in the villages. Also, when we talked about it at that time, or maybe people didn't think about it, <coughs> there was no need to show that you existed on this land because it was taken for granted. That, okay, yeah, we're here all the time. It doesn't really matter. If you, don't, you didn't have to prove it. But as time progressed, now we have to prove it, because facts on the, on the ground really changed. So I think the context plays a lot mm. in this. Yeah. I think I'll stop here. Thank you.